Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister of Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon, everyone. It's my great honor to have Prime Minister Imran Khan and Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi today addressing uh, a presser at the UN. So without much ado, I will hand over to the Prime Minister. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. The main reason I came to attend the United Nations General Assembly was to highlight the plight of people of uh, Kashmir. Uh, there are a lot of problems. We are trying to fix a lot of things. Uh, Pakistan faces challenges, and so therefore, I would not really have come out at this time. But I came out to New York only because I felt that unless we highlight what is going on in Kashmir, uh, the world is not going to know. Neither will the, the people know the oppression that is going on, nor will the world understand that this is just the beginning. It's going to get worse. And uh, there's a potential that two nuclear armed countries will come face to face, face at some stage. So hence, I felt that it is extremely important that we highlight what is happening in Kashmir amongst the world leaders and a forum like the United Nations General Assembly. Today, 50 days, people of Kashmir have been locked down by 900,000 soldiers. For 50 days, there's no news coming out of Kashmir. Uh, there's a total news blackout. I have met Kashmiris uh, in New York who have complained that they can't get in touch with their families. They don't know what's going on. We know of mass arrests. We know that the uh, entire leadership of uh, Kashmir, even those leaders who were pro-India, uh, who wanted to be part of India, even those Kashmiri leaders are now uh, somewhere uh, uh, in jail in India. We know that young people, boys, have been picked up. We know that uh, the hospitals are not functioning. Uh, one of the members uh, of uh, 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 who came to see me, who belongs to Kashmir, told me that uh, uh, his relative suffers from dialysis uh, has uh, kidney problems, so has to have dialysis, uh, and he's fearing for his life. So basically, my my whole point of saying uh, of of coming here was to highlight this. This is unprecedented. Eight million people in an open jail uh, is unprecedented in this day and age. And then this nonsense that this is a part of India, so the world should stay out. Just to remind the world that there are 11 Security Council, UN Security Council resolutions that recognize Kashmir as a disputed territory and which gave the right to people of Kashmir the right of self-determination through a plebiscite to decide the destiny. That right has been given to the people of Kashmir. For 70 years, this plebiscite never took place. And then unilaterally, this BJP government has annexed Kashmir. Why, uh, they have gone against their own constitution. They've uh, revoked the constitution of Article 370. And so what we fear now, I mean, the next point is what is going to happen? What we fear, and which is the stated aim of uh, the BJP government, 
that they will change the demogra demography of Kashmir to change the demography of an occupied uh, uh, piece of land is against the fourth Geneva Convention. It's, it's considered a war crime. And secondly, the biggest worry is what happens once the curfew is lifted? We fare with 900,000 soldiers there, there will be a massacre. And that's also what we are trying to tell the world community, that they must act on it. And my other fear is that India, for whatever is happening in Kashmir, will blame on Pakistan. Last February, there was a, a Kashmiri boy who blew himself up uh, on an in, uh, Indian military convoy. The parents of the boy said that the, he was radicalized by the security forces through on some checkpoints or something. Nothing to do with Pakistan. Yet Pakistan was immediately blamed for it. We, I went on air and said, if you give us any proof that Pakistan is involved, we'll take action. Before any proofs could come, the Indian jets arrived. They bombed us. In retaliation, Pakistani jets went and bombed India. On their way back, they were chased by uh, two Indian jets who were shot down. Immediately, we returned the pilot who fell in Pakistan, and we returned to India. But unfortunately, that was treated not as a gesture of peace, that we no didn't want escalation between two nuclear armed countries. It was taken as... Uh, sign of weakness, how we were scared of the might of India. And the sad fact is that unfortunately, India today is governed by a racist, a Hindu supremacist, a party, RSS, which was banned in India two or three times as, as a terrorist organization. RSS was res responsible for the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who is a life member of RSS, was responsible for the pogrom which took place in Gujarat, where 2,000 people were, were butchered, burnt, under his chief ministership, and for three days the state did not do anything. 150,000 people became homeless, Muslims became homeless. Unfortunately, India has been, is past six years, is being governed by an extremist party. It believed in, uh, in the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from India. This is what the founding fathers of RSS, you can just Google and read what they said. Uh, in the, who they were impressed by, Adolf Hitler, Mussolini were, were, the, were their role models. This is all, you can just Google it and you'll find. And this is what we face right now. The moment my party came to power, we tried to do everything to make uh, amend, amend our relationship with India. We, I approached him, I called Prime Minister Modi, said we have similar problems. You and we, we have... Uh, Poverty, unemployment, and of course, climate change is going to affect both Pakistan and India. And all these efforts were re rebuffed. We thought it was because of the election campaign. We thought maybe, you know, a, a nationalist party would uh, pander to its base. So we waited till after the elections. And once the elections were over, we again approached them, and then we found that they were trying to push us into the FATF blacklist to bankrupt Pakistan. That's when we thought, realized there was an agenda. And of course, on 5th August, the agenda came forward. They do not consider Muslims as equal citizens. Neither do they consider Christians as equal citizens. Uh, they do not believe in the Nehru, Gandhi, secular, plural Indian society. India is changing has changed in the six years. I know India. I have friendships I know uh, through cricket. I know the India 
of Nehru and Gandhi, and I know what is going on now. So I'm alarmed, and I think the world leaders need to know. I've spoken to the world leaders. I've spoken to President Trump. I've, uh, I've spoken to Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister. On telephone, I've spoken to Angela Merkel, uh, to um, uh, 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 um, uh, President Macron of, uh, of France. I've spoken to the Muslim leaders. And this is the time for world to act before this goes too far. Because this is the first time after the Cuban crisis, two nuclear armed countries are going to come face to face. And what we fear is already the statements that, be, that are being given, that terrorists are being lined up on the borders of Kashmir, waiting from Pakistan to go inside. What sort of a nonsense is this? What possible benefit is Pakistan going to have now sending in terrorists when there are 900,000 security forces there? All that will happen is that there will be more oppression uh, on the people of Kashmir. Why would we want to, what will we achieve from that except Pakistan will be blamed and secondly, uh, there will be more oppression uh, uh, of the people of Kashmir. And, but this is typical, uh, I've heard Prime Minister Narendra Modi talk about this, that Pakistan should stop terrorism. What is, what is worse than this sort of state terrorism that is going on? How can they, anyone justify Eight million people locked up inside. What justification could there possibly be for this? For 50 days. Meeting cancelled here. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, by the time I leave here, everyone, I will be able to uh, apprise everyone of the situation. I also want the United Nations to, they have a responsibility. After all, it is the United Nations Security Council re resolution that gave the Kashmiris the right of self-determination. And what is happening to them right now, responsibility lies on the United Nations too. And also I think of finally of the world leaders, the big countries, the powerful countries, I would urge them to look beyond big markets. There are certain, this thing, if this thing goes wrong, it will, the effects will go way beyond the borders of the subcontinent. And this obsession with big markets and, and trade and all that, I mean, this is serious. And I again repeat, we do not know what will happen after the curfew is lifted. And my fear is that with 900,000 troops there, there will be a massacre. Yes, Mr. Prime Minister. <coughs> Wait, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, Michelle from Reuters, please go ahead. Prime Minister Michelle Nichols from Reuters. Uh, on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thanks so much for the news conference. Um, there was a report earlier, to, as you said, um, you met with President Trump yesterday. There was a report earlier today that President Trump has asked you to mediate um, between the United States and Iran. Is that true? Can you elaborate? Has President Trump asked you to take a message to President Rouhani? Uh, before President Trump, I stopped over in Saudi Arabia because of the drone attacks on their oil facility. And I spoke to uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, and he also asked me to uh, talk to the uh, Iranian president. He knew I was meeting him. And so also President Trump asked me that if we could uh, de-escalate the situation and, uh, and maybe come up with another deal. So I did convey this, and yes, we are trying our best. Uh, the, it's a, an ongoing thing, so I can't reveal more than that. So, sorry, just a quick follow-up. So, yes, you are now mediating between the United States and Iran. And when did you speak with President Rouhani? I immediately spoke to President Rouhani uh, yesterday, after after the meeting with the President Trump. Uh, and but I can't say anything right now more than this, but except that we are trying uh, and and mediating. Uh, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that there is no conflict. You see, I, I do not believe that conflicts actually uh, resolve anything. I mean, we have uh, the situation in Afghanistan, and here's uh, me on record saying that I was anti this uh, uh, 
you know, the whole war in Afghanistan and Pakistan becoming part of this war. And I was told both times that, look, the war in Afghanistan will be over in a few weeks and Pakistan will only be involved in it for a few weeks. So, you know, 19 years down the line, you, you know, we have a situation. Uh, again, by the way, we are still hoping. I've spoken to President Trump. We are trying now to uh, 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 get the talks restarted between Taliban and the Americans. And hopefully, if, a, if the deal uh, is signed, which was almost about to be signed, uh, then I would try and uh, meet the Taliban to convince them to talk to the Afghan government then. Because until now, that's where the hitch was. Taliban want, were talking to the Americans, but not to the Afghan government. So we are very, so Pakistan is affected by this, uh, by all the turmoil in Afghanistan. We desperately want there to be peace, also for the sake of people of Afghanistan. Also, uh, this would be a, a tragedy for not just Pakistan, but I mean for all uh, developing uh, countries with their uh, budgets being affected if, if this war uh, uh, takes place and the oil prices shoot up. It's going to cause much more poverty, so we'll try our best in both cases. Thank you. James, uh, Al Jazeera, and after this, if I can't identify somebody, please identify yourself before you ask a question. James, go ahead. James Bays from Al Jazeera. On Kashmir, I've heard absolutely everything you've said, but I still want to ask this question. You're here in New York. <coughs> Prime Minister Modi is here in New York. You both had meetings with President Trump. Is there a possibility of face-to-face -face diplomacy? Is there a chance for diplomacy on Kashmir? Look, uh, before 5th August, Pakistan tried everything. You know, I spoke to President Modi too, saying we have similar problems. Our problem is poverty, above anything. The responsibility of the head of state above anything is to get people out of poverty. And conflict is one that creates poverty. And uh, sadly, as I said, there was no response. Now, after the 5th of August, I'm afraid, they, there's no, what is the point of talking now? What they had done to Kashmir, uh, unless and until uh, they uh, lift the curfew and then restore that Article 370, there's no chance of talking. So that's why we've asked President Trump and other world leaders to intervene. The lady in pink right here. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you're a man of enormous sophistication, and you're aware, I know, that there are very often forces behind the kinds of conflicts you're facing now. You have mentioned the Security Council. Now, uh, one of my concerns, if this issue becomes before the Security Council is there has been a tendency to attack uh, Islamic countries, Iraq, uh, Libya, and now Syria. And wouldn't it be risky to get the Security Council with its multiple interests conflicting involved in this? What would your expectation or hope be? Look, I mean, uh, if ever, if ever the Security Council has to move, it's now. And I'll say for two reasons. One, the people of Kashmir are suffering simply because the Security Council could not implement its decision to allow them the right of self-determination. The 11 resolutions. So it's their responsibility. Eight million people are locked inside for 50 days. It's inhuman. So what is the Security Council for then? Second, this has a potential of, uh, of the unthinkable. Two nuclear armed countries face to face. Surely the Security Council came into being to stop this. I mean, yeah. this is, this is at ba as bad as it gets. Yeah. So here's me, the reason I, I started by saying, I would not have come out of Pakistan because, you know, we are just about coming out of a really difficult economic situation and governance issues, and fighting a corrupt mafia. I would not have come here. But I, I'm alarmed, because here's me. There, there's one prime minister that side, there's one this side. You know, a sane mind can't think of uh, a nuclear war. Mm. No sane mind can think of it. We grew up and after the Cuban crisis, and all of us sort of knew that the, the Cold War 
war was there because the other war was unimaginable. But when you have what you have in India right now, and I say this, who, has, who knows India? This is an ideology, a racist ideology, which believes in the supremacy of a, a Hindu race. The other races are not supposed to be equal. You, how do you reason with them? How do, you un, how do you reason with what they've done in Kashmir? I mean, would you expect a civilized society to do what they've done? I'm locked in, eight million people. So therefore, I'm worried that if this goes on, this, there can easily be a miscalculation. And that's why the United Nations must act. The lady uh, in the white suit at the back, please identify yourself. We'll come to you, Mateen, in a minute. Let's just take uh, some Anka members. Thank you very much. My name is Nazira Azim Karimi. I'm an Afghan journalist. Mr. Khan, as Afghan people, I have high expectation because from you, because you're peace ambassador, you are a very famous soccer player. No, no, cricket. cricket. Yeah. <laughs> Ball game, more or less the same. <laughs> Ball is involved. Uh, as a peace ambassador, which role Pakistan should play to bring Taliban and the table to make negotiations with the Afghan government? What is the reason why they don't want to talk with Afghan government? Thank you. Um, well, this was a sticking point, as you're right, that the uh, Taliban were willing to talk to the Americans, but not to the Afghan government. Uh, and uh, at one point, the Taliban wanted to meet me, uh, but the, I asked the Afghan government, and this, they asked me not to meet them. So uh, uh, the reason they said was that um, uh, until President Ghani came to Pakistan, only then afterwards I should meet them. So I was planning to meet them once they had signed the deal with the Americans, uh, and I would have met them for only one reason, that they should now talk to the Afghan government. But unfortunately, on a tweet, we found out that the deal was off. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it's very sad because that was very close. And once the deal was made, then, you know, the progress would have been made. But let me just be clear. There is no military solution, which is what I've been saying for a long time. And, and once the Afghans get together, they will find a solution. It must be, you know, the, if the government sits down with the Taliban, they will be, they'll, they'll find a solution. But it's a question of getting them there. If the Khab, APP. representatives of international humanitarian organizations, what is it that prevents them to carry out their mandated uh, uh, task of providing relief to the Kashmiri people and to, the, uh, and to visit the prisoners, which they are mandated to do? Um, uh, to, to, be, uh, to be absolutely frank, I am a bit disappointed. Uh, by uh, international community. Uh, I'm disappointed first because, you know, where if 8 million Europeans were put under siege like this for 50 days or Jews were put under siege or uh, Americans were put on siege, uh, well, forget Americans, even eight Americans were put under siege, but <laughs> I'm talking about um, any other, I mean, would, this, would the reaction have been the same? You know, they make statements and uh, there is no pressure as yet on Narendra Modi to lift the siege. So we will keep mounting the pressure. And I, I will tell the UN, I mean, I'm speaking on Friday, I will tell them that if there is a massacre, I mean, what are 900,000 troops doing there? When India says that, you know, these Pakistan is sending uh, these uh, terrorists, 500 terrorists. What can 500 terrorists do in front of 900,000 troops? Why would you send 500 uh, terrorists uh, as what they're saying? 900,000 troops are not to fight terrorists. They are to control, intimidate, and subjugate a population. And population 
the entire Muslim population, I mean. This is why it is, it is going to have repercussions far beyond Kashmir. Because 1.3 billion Muslims are watching this. Where is the world community? Where is the international community? Where are laws? United Nations Security Council had given them that right of self-determination. And what is happening to them now? So this will have repercussions. It's going to create radicalization. This is going to get worse. I'm flagging it right now because this is just the beginning. Once the curfew is lifted, God knows what is going to happen after that. Do they expect that the people of Kashmir, who have already lost 100,000 people in over uh, 30 years, do they think that just because India has revoked Article 370, they will quietly accept the status quo? They will accept uh, to, that India has taken over and annexed Kashmir? Of course, this is going to be a... This, there's likely, every likelihood of there being a massacre. So the world community will be responsible. Mateen Heather. Can I just add to what the Prime Minister said to your question, sir? The president of the ICRC met the Prime Minister yesterday, and he said that in order to go and operate in Jammu and Kashmir, Indian occupied side, they need permits. They've applied for permits, and they've been they have neither been refused nor been given permits. So practically, they're you know, they're inaccessible. Yes, Mr. Prime Minister over here, Mateen has a duty with you. Jyoti. So you just expressed disappointment over international community's cause response. And, but you are saying at the same time you are making all efforts, meeting world leaders. What is the reason India is unmoved? And when you met uh, President Trump, again he said that he is ready to mediate if requested, so when he will be requested, and second part of it, how serious is the threat of attack or adventure from the Indian side, and what is your defense preparation? Do we have uh, the capability to thwart any possible aggression from India with full force? Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Look, um, I'm disappointed because I really feel, not, not, as a, not as a Pakistani Prime Minister, as a human being, I feel disappointed that how can the world community stay quiet when 8 million people are being treated worse than animals? It's just a, a, a simply disappointment coming from there. Secondly, I know why, why the response is uh, lukewarm, and I know why Mr. Modi is not pushed at the moment. The reason is because India... People look upon India as a market of 1.2 billion people. Sadly, I mean, sadly, this is what is happening. M material comes over the human. So it's because it's a big market. They, are, they know it's wrong. Everyone I've spoken to knows this is wrong. Some are appalled by it. But they keep quiet because in the end they start thinking of a market. But my simple message to all those who are looking at a big market. This can go very wrong. To your point, to your second question. Last time when uh, they made Pakistan an excuse for this, a boy brutalized by the Indian security force, forces who blew himself up, they blamed Pakistan and bombed us. And once you... Once a conflict starts between two nuclear-armed countries, and I told the Indian public, too, on television, I said it will go beyond me, my hands, or, or your prime minister's hands once it starts. Who knows where it's going to end up? So it's madness to allow this, this whole situation to, to deteriorate further, because it's only going to de deteriorate. But again, I repeat, what will happen when you lift the curfew? What is going to happen? What do they think that the Kashmiris, after how they've treated them, are they going to quietly now accept India, um, uh, that, that India has taken over Kashmir and they'll accept it? I think, I fear, I fear there's going to be a bloodbath. And that's when things will start deteriorating very rapidly. I know you all want to ask questions. I'll come to you one by one. The lady in the blue, please go ahead and if you can identify yourself. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Betül Yürük from the Turkish News Agency, Anadolu. You had a meeting with uh, Turkish President Erdogan yesterday. Uh, do you think uh, Turkey could play a role to help resolve the issue between Pakistan and India? Thank you. Well, first of all, I really want to thank uh, uh, President Erdogan for mentioning today Kashmir in his speech. Uh, and uh, uh, we really feel that uh, I hope that after him more leaders take his lead and at least, at least, ask India to lift the siege. Um, we have a very, very good relationship with Turkey. And uh, uh, President Erdogan is coming over to Pakistan next month, which we hope to receive. We hope to increase our uh, uh, trade, uh, all sorts of, uh, we're going to have financial agreements with Turkey. Uh, and yes, we are very thankful that uh, the president has uh, taken a very principled stand. Please go ahead. Uh, we'll, come, we'll come to you, sir, in a minute. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the press conference, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is uh, Ibtisam Azim from the Daily Arabic, uh, Al Arab Al Jadid newspaper. My question uh, to you is you said that you will keep mounting the pressure. Uh, could you tell us which steps are you going to take? And then to which extent are you afraid that the situation of Kashmir will be very similar to what's happening in the occupied Palestinian territories where you have a lot of resolutions, a lot of uh, sympathy? Uh, but on the ground, there is no um, uh, concrete steps to help the local people. Thank you very much. You see, just like uh, uh, until the Palestinians are given a just settlement, th there will always be a problem there. But, you know, of course, Israel is very powerful and probably at the peak of its, its might. And so for the time being, they've put a lid on it. But eventually there has to be some some settlement there with a, a just settlement where the Palestinians uh, have a homeland. Um, I think that Kashmir is going to be a bit different. For 30 years, uh, Kashmir, people of Kashmir have wanted this freedom movement has grown. Today, the act done by the Indian government of shutting uh, people in their homes for 50 days has alienated the entire spectrum of Kashmiri public. There were times people who were pro-Indian and who were, uh, you know, as I say, uh, there were Kashmiri leaders like Umar Abdullah and uh, uh, Mehbooba Mufti who were pro-India. Uh, Today, no one will be able to ever get a vote in Kashmir who's pro-India because of what they've, they've done. And they've actually, what the BJP government has done is it has actually told the Kashmiris that you're not equal human beings. They're not, they do, do not consider them human beings. Only, hence, a mind, a mindset can put people inside what they've done. And not thinking through what happens once the siege is lifted. I do not think Narendra Modi knows what's going to happen. The gentleman right here. Uh, yes. Uh, after after this, this, we are we are going to have an OIC summit meeting. We will gather all the... Uh, uh, Muslim uh, countries simply for one thing. The only reason, the only reason the people of Kashmir are being subjected to this is because they're Muslims. And this is resonating in 1.3 billion Muslims. And it's very important for Muslim world to play its part because they're only suffering because they're Muslims. The Hindu Kashmiris are not suffering. And that's why it is important for them to take a stand because if the Muslim countries don't take a stand for whatever reason, for their own trade or whatever agreements. That's what leads to radicalization when the governments do not express the wishes of the people and when they see injustice. So I hope that, um, you know, the Muslim countries, uh, we will uh, have the OIC meeting next month. Uh, Joseph, Joseph Klein of Canada Free Press. Uh, you've been quoted as saying that um, uh, Pakistan had originally trained al-Qaeda forces and also that you uh, regretted uh, the decision by the Pakistani government uh, after the 9-11 uh, attack to side with America uh, against the, what would then refer to as terrorists. Um, 
I, what assurances have you given to President Trump um, that Pakistan will indeed help in the fight against terrorists, uh, including within Pakistan, that are aligned with the uh, Taliban? Because I believe the second in command in the uh, provisional tr transition um, uh, commission or council that was being considered has significant ties with the terrorist organization in Pakistan. So what, what kind of assurances are you okay. Uh, okay. willing to give? Let me, um, what I said, and let me explain it in, in the exact context which I spoke. 1979, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. 1980, 81, uh, the Americans decided to back Pakistan, uh, to, uh, to uh, back the freedom struggle in Afghanistan. And in the 80s then, uh, jihad was declared against the Soviets. And Muslims from all over the world were invited to participate in the jihad, means of freedom struggle for Afghanistan against the Soviets. Amongst them were Al-Qaeda. All these uh, different organizations, Mujahideen groups, all arrived in Pakistan to defeat the Soviets in Afghanistan. And of course, Pakistan trained them, but they were funded by the Americans, uh, by, by the Western countries, because all the Western countries backed the Afghan Jihad. So my whole point was then, then Mujahideen, who were doing, the Russians would call terrorism, but then we would call them freedom fighters. But they were trained in the art of guerrilla warfare, which the Russians called terrorism. And so when the Soviets left, my whole point is that the United States also packed up and left. And we were left with the groups. So I was just explaining how come when they talk about uh, Pakistan having these groups, this is how we ended up having the groups. If it would have been, which is what we hope now, we hope that there's a proper transition from Taliban, uh, from, so from when the Americans pull out of Afghanistan, we hope there's a transition to a, a, a proper political solution rather than just packing up and going as, as happened in 89. There will again be chaos in Afghanistan. So my whole point is that uh, when they left, chaos happened in Afghanistan. Pakistan had the fallout. We were left with these groups, all dressed up and nowhere to go. And we were blamed in the end. Uh, and nine, after 9-11, when the same groups from Mujahideen turned into terrorists, Pakistan was blamed for it. We were given the job now to clear this up. And we ended up losing 70,000 people uh, in, 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 from 2003 onwards. And so my whole point is that uh, either we should not have participated in the Afghan Jihad, had, once we, were, we had participated, then we, would not, we should not have been part of the American war on terror because they turned all, the people who had we trained against the Soviets and foreign occupation, when the Americans occupied Afghanistan, they turned on Pakistan. Azim Mia and then um, Jhanzeb of ARY. Azim Mia, please go ahead. Mr. Prime Minister, now you have met President Trump, so he has, he has met uh, Modi also. He has met him on both sides and looks like he has got a tilt towards India. So that's one option. Secretary General says that the resolutions on Kashmir were not under Chapter 7. So according to the procedure of the Secretariat, Chapter 6 resolutions are non-binding. And in all that kind of a situation, what are the options left, you know, except appealing to the international community? Because the international community looks like that right now, in the face of Indian-American alliance, uh, things are getting bad. Uh, so what, you know, what procedures you are going to adopt, and what is your approach, and where are you heading? Thank Ajah, you. Uh, Azim, did you say I begged President Trump? No, you met President Trump. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I've never begged any from anyone. So I, I have met, and I, I apprised. I apprise President Trump exactly of the situation, and I have told him, like I have told you, the gravity of the situation. This could go serious. Look, intelligent human beings start thinking ahead. I mean, you, you know, you have to think of the uh, hope for the best, 
but you should be prepared for the worst. The worst scenario in this is unthinkable. Normal human beings do not think of that. And so therefore, it is my job to tell them, in my opinion, things will deteriorate. We will keep them apprised. At least we have informed the world community what's going on. And as, as time goes on, and if, and I fear that this is going to end up in a massacre, at least we will be able to tell the world community. And if in India blames Pakistan for this, then at least the world would know about it. Previously, it was anything that happened in India. Look, what has been going on in the past? After 9-11, you use that magic word, Islamic terrorism, and all humanitarian rights were waved aside. You could do whatever you like with the people, provided you could term them as Islamic terrorist. And this is exactly what Narendra Modi is doing. This, uh, this near genocide which he's about to commit, he's blaming it on Islamic terrorism, hoping that he'll get away with it. And that's why it's important for us to communicate with the Western world and civilized world and tell them what is happening. That's why we're telling them, send your own observers and find out what's happening. If India has nothing to worry about, and guess what the excuse of uh, shutting down putting people uh, 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 under curfew and uh, shutting them in their houses for 50 days, the ex excuse is that this is to develop Kashmir. Mm -hmm. This is for prosperity of Kashmir. This is what the Narendra Modi position is. So it's important for us to tell the world, and I know now, I'm satisfied, that at least everyone knows. I've apprised all the major world leaders of the situation in Kashmir. The follow-up question ja, is... No, 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 Azimia. No, no, Azimia. No, 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 Azimia. No, there are other thank people you, uh, who want to ask you. a question. Thank Go ahead, Jahzeb. Thank you, uh -huh. thank you Ambassador Malia. Uh, this is Jahzeb Ali from Airline News TV, Pakistan. Uh, Prime Minister, like uh, President Trump, Secretary General of the United Nations also offered to mediate between India and Pakistan on Kashmir issue. Uh, 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 um, um, sorry. I just, on <laughs> Kashmir issue. So, sir, uh, Can we mean, learn you still have to meet him. Sir, uh, will you comment on the role of United Nations? Just, I mean, United just, Nations just, also just, failed to implement its own resolutions for the last many, mm, many just, years. Okay. So, Thank in, you. Your, in your opinion, what's, what's the reason Thank for that? Thank you, Jazeb. Ji, uh, Jazeb, uh, inshallah, you will see that this, is, this issue is not now going to die down. You will see in time. Don. Anwar Iqbal or Masood Heather, you decide amongst the two. Anwar. Huh? <laughs> Sorry. I have a very brief, very simple question. You are here, you met one leader, you will be speaking in two days, and you will go back. What other options do you have now if the international committee does not respond? Look, Anwar, let's be straight about this. What options have we got apart from this? I mean, we can't attack India if, you know, clearly that's not an option. Apart from that, we are doing everything possible. Apart from sort of, uh, you know, uh, starting a war, we are doing everything possible we can. We are all the time exploring every possibility. We're making sure every uh, world leader knows about the situation. Uh, I will be speaking uh, on Friday as well, and I will uh, try my best to make the world understand, but apart, and then media, I'm going to, uh, you see, I believe that the media is very powerful. The Western media, uh, I had meetings last night and I realized that uh, a lot of them already know what is going on. And so it, I, I know what happened in Bosnia. When the ethnic cleansing of Muslims started in Bosnia, for a while the, wor the world did nothing. But the media put such a pressure that eventually the world had to do something. And I believe that in Kashmir, it's exactly the same thing will happen. Even though countries are worried about their economic interests and markets, I believe that this is a much bigger issue than markets and economic interest. And eventually, the world will be interested. Let's take Hassan from the Daily Times. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, <clears throat> uh, in the past, we have seen we had General Musharraf four-point formula, and we also had a Chinab formula. What proposal would you suggest to resolve Kashmir if you are able to talk to India in the well, near future? Well, for, for a start, they have to lift the curfew. Mm -hmm. That's the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this inhuman curfew of 50 days, 
Even the Congress party in India has commented that poor people have been shut inside for 50 days. Uh, 50 days they've, uh, uh, no one knows what's happening with all the prisoners, political prisoners, thousands of them. And in Thank the, you very and much. In that, have... in that formula, there was a problem. And the problem was the third party, <laughs> the most affected party, the Kashmiris were not in the loop. We have one last question. Go ahead. Uh, I'll just repeat, I'll repeat what I said. Uh, we were very surprised because the deal was about to be signed when uh, on, from a tweet we found out that the deal had been broken. So what we hope is that, uh, and what we will try do, and do, is to actually get back that deal to be signed and then Pakistan will, will do its best to get the Taliban to talk to the Afghan government. Really appreciate as you have conveyed Pakistan's narrative loud and clearly across the world. During these days, you have uh, met with different uh, head of states, including Donald Trump. Now, in your opinion, what they are thinking and uh, how much they are convinced? If no mediation, then what next? Look, uh, the disappointment is not because I think that people of Kashmir, I feel that what Narendra Modi has done, uh, he has uh, boxed himself into a blind alley. There is no way for him to go from now onwards except a general massacre of people of, of Kashmir when the, uh, when the curfew is lifted. There's no other way for him to go. So I feel that from now onwards, and I know that the people of Kashmir for 30 years have been uh, fighting for their independence and 100,000 have lost their lives. They've lost fear of death. When a population, and you're talking about not a uh, few thousands, 8 million people, when they lose fear of dying and freedom becomes much more important than living a life of uh, uh, a slavery, I don't, I don't think that he will be able to stop this now. I think the momentum will, will gain pace. So I'm not disappointed about where it is headed because I know that this will eventually now end up in freedom for people of Kashmir. What I'm disappointed is that for some reason, countries put their economic interests ahead of human beings. This is the same with climate change. Countries, because of not wanting to lose their growth rate, do not realize that what impending disaster climate, uh, this climate change is bringing to the world. Neither, neither do countries, for instance, which I'll be speaking about, this money laundering which comes from the develop, developing world into the rich countries every year, billions and billions of dollars from poor countries moves to uh, rich countries from through corruption, ruling elites of third uh, uh, developing world, taking the money out. And unfortunately, because it, if, if anything, the, the richer countries gain from it, they do not take any steps to stop it. This is a plunder of the poor countries. The poor countries are getting poorer. The rich are getting richer. And these criminals who plunder the poor countries have an easy way of parking their money, buying flats in New York and London. And that's what we want. We want the world to take notice of this. The richer countries, they should have strong money laundering laws. They should, if we can identify that money has been stolen from our countries, it should be immediately uh, uh, given back to us. But, but, but this is the problem because the laws are so... The laws are so complicated, and if the, if the rich countries want, they can easily tighten the laws so that it will be the biggest deterrent for these criminals in third world to take the money out. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very well, much. Last question. Thank you. <laughs> 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 